the end of the presentation, there, after the presentation, there will be uh, some links. We actually have a code. You can try try it out if you, if you would like to. And yeah, there's like a small uh, site for the whole paper with the CVPR video and all the stuff. Okay, let's start. Um, sorry, I will take my small script. Um, so what is the uncertainty estimation in general? Like what is the motivation of this task? Uh, in general, when we work with uh, any kind of uh, deep learning applications, we're working with a simple pipeline when we have inputs and we're trying to predict some targets. But for a lot of different applications, like important applications, we have necessity to estimate confidence of those predictions. Um, one of the probably the most popular classical methods to do this, everybody know about is uh, Gaussian processes, when you actually predict like a mean and STD with which you can estimate the confidence of predictions the model makes for one particular point. You can see the example of this thing on the slide. And another thing I wanted to mention, I kind of combined uh, parts of visualizations from CVPR. So sometimes text on the slide actually replicates something on the small video, but I'm not sure if it's very it's bad or not. Whatever, just to make you know. So yeah, there's a lot of applications for this thing. Uh, in classical machine learning, there's a lot of methods to do this. Pretty much all of the um, classical machine learning uh, regression models, uh, whatever, uh, they are somehow dealing with uncertainty estimation, but for deep learning, uh, the necessity to use uncertainty is still here, but sometimes very hard to actually apply existing classical methods to deep learning. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's the reason why there is a lot of work being done toward kind of bringing those methods to, to deep learning, to develop new methods, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, just a couple of examples of uh, applications for this thing. I roughly divided them in three groups. Uh, one of them, one of those, could be medical applications in finance. Uh, those areas when we actually need like a safety part, we need to be sure about predictions we are making. For example, we cannot say that the person has a cancer uh, wrongly because the cost of the error is very high. Another application could be robotics and self-driving. Here we have uncertainty for better exploration, for example. Uh, and uh, the third one I decided to, to put here, it could be active learning and self-supervised learning. With uncertainty, we can uh, use uh, more data efficient pipelines as active learning, for example, or sometimes we can just improve our training in many ways and yeah, just make our model better. Uh, but that's not the full list. Obviously, there's many, many more applications, but this should give you uh, the rough understanding that the, the topic and the, the area is important. Uh, switching to uh, the most popular models, I guess, uh, I can confidently say that Bayesian methods, Bayesian techniques are very popular for this kind of task. Uh, for example, we have MCMC, we have variational inference, we apply them to many classical models, uh, but they have, in general, they have kind of two, several disadvantages and several advantages. For Bayesian models, we obviously have uh, solid theoretical grounding, we have proofs, we have convergence and etc. cetera. Uh, they could learn like exact posterior within some conditions, but at the same time, many of those methods when we are trying to apply them to deep learning. Since we are doing a lot of approximations, uh, we are getting just slower training, slower inference, and in general, we are getting worse performance. Uh, and that's kind of makes us think like, okay, but what could be the escape from this? How we can resolve this problem? Um, probably that, that's not completely the case uh, right now, but let's say three years ago, uh, there was two major models to apply uncertainty, to, to utilize uncertainty. Those were, were uh, MC dropout and deep ensembles. And um, that's kind of started the motivation why we actually wrote this particular paper. We focused on those two methods and decided to look closer at them. Uh, just a brief introduction, the, the MC dropout is one of the, uh, one of these two <laughs> popular methods and it, uh, the, the way it works is rather simple. We just train a model with uh, 
and uh, with dropout layers. And the only difference uh, from the uh, kind of original setup to, to just to train it, to regularize the model and et cetera, we're actually not turning it off during inference and we kind of sample it during the inference to make, uh, to produce uncertainty. Uh, there is uh, in the original paper, I think it calls paper, we have uh, proofs that, uh, yeah, that the, 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 this method has solid theoretical grounding that it's actually variational inference. In, uh, in some conditions. Uh, the another advantage of this method is that we, it's very easy to apply. Basically you can use any kind of model, any kind of architecture, any kind of task. Uh, but in general, one of the drawbacks of this method is that it just performs worse than ensembles. In, in my experience and the number of paper suggested. Um, and yeah, in general, when you have a, situation when you have a model already trained, or you already uh, figured out this training setup and et cetera, and then you're deciding that, okay, I, need, I also need to apply uncertainty to, to my task. And you kind of inject these dropout layers. In general, it leads to uh, the, the performance kind of drops, could drop, not always, but in my experience, at least, that was happening a lot. Um, as I already said, another popular uh, approach to uncertainty estimation is uh, ensembles approach, which is also rather simple to understand, to grasp. Uh, it's very easy to, to use because you just train several models uh, independently and then uh, making several predictions for one particular input, you can figure out uh, from variability, from variance of those predictions, you can figure out so what is uncertainty for this particular input. Uh, several, the, mo the, the major advantages of this method is are, uh, has good quality of uncertainty, produces good quality of uncertainty in, in, in a way of, for example, auto distribution detection or calibration. Uh, it works pretty much with any kind of architecture because you, in general, don't have to make any changes. But the major drawback is that um, obviously you're getting this memory and uh, computations overheads and you're getting just increased training time. For some kind of applications, it's just not acceptable. For example, uh, in my experience, when I was trying to apply um, uncertainty methods to uh, robotics applications, when we have like a ed edge devices, like actual like robot or drone, that's just not acceptable. You cannot do this because you cannot just increase your, I don't know, memory or CPU. It's just not possible. It's not the option. And that makes it hard to apply to, to these particular situations. Um, one of the particular <clears throat> observations we made is that in general, those two types of uh, approaches could be kind of unified in a way that we can look at both of them as a, as a masking procedures. So for MC dropouts, it's kind of obvious. We already have this binary masks when we uh, make inference, when we train the model. For deep ensembles, we just need to look at uh, deep ensembles model as a kind of masking procedure when masks are completely, they do not overlap at all. So they just do not share any features. And uh, yeah, this particular observation made us think like, okay, maybe there, there is like uni unified framework to actually kind of bind them together. Uh, yeah, and eventually that's the result that the paper is the result of this observation. Uh, let's look at this a bit closer. Uh, as already said, deep ensembles could uh, be perceived as a masking uh, procedure where masks do not share any features, like they just don't have any common features. And we have a predefined finite number of masks. Like when we train them an ensemble of five models, we have, we can say that we have five uh, non-overlapping masks. Or if we have like 10, we have 10 non-overlapping masks. In case of MC dropout, we have, um, the, the, those masks we are sampling are they have uh, the the they share a lot of features, uh, but at the same time we could perceive this model as a model with infinite number of masks because when we sample not infinite okay but exponentially large number of masks, and uh, yeah in general and you can look at single model for example when we solve classification model we also can produce uncertainty in a way 
Uh, you can look at single model as a, also as a masking procedure when you have, uh, like for example, five different masks, but they all share the same features and it makes kind of, it's not possible to produce uncertainty in this way, obviously, but anyway, a single model also fits into this particular framework. So when we thought about this from this perspective, we figured out that, okay, it seems like there could be something in between all those models and uh, we somehow can generate this uh, kind of interpolated method, let's say. Um, yes, yeah, so that brings us to actual mask samples approach. There is two steps in uh, mask samples approach. The first step consists of pre-generating a number of predefined and fixed masks with some particular properties. Uh, and the more, probably the, 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 the sole property we are trying to uh, achieve to generate is <clears throat> how many features those masks share. In this, on this particular slide, you can see example of uh, three masks with uh, five features each, but only three of those features for every masks are active. And uh, yeah, eventually you can figure out uh, the um, number of shared features, like average number of shared features between masks. This, uh, this particular value, this uh, average intersection, I would say, would mean how correlated models are. For example, if we have, uh, if all of the masks are the same, then the correlation is like 100%. If they do not share features at all, then we have zero correlation. And then the step two is just to train this, uh, our model the same way as uh, MC dropout with just activate mask samples layer. Uh, yeah, there's no difference in training from the perspective of uh, dropout. So yeah, that's pretty much the whole approach. Just predefined, generate predefined masks with uh, particular properties you want, and then train the same way as, way as dropout, MC dropout. Can I ask a, maybe a naive question or simple question? Yeah. Uh, so, um, what what do what do you expect to get from merging this? Uh, like, um, I don't know, to have to have some continuum between dropout and uh, ensembles. So the motivation for this, I mean, from theoretical perspective, yeah. it's kind of just a cool feature that okay, those two methods could be connected. But from yeah. practical perspective. When we talk about uh, ensembles and MC dropout, I already mentioned that both of them have their own disadvantages and advantages. And when we create this continuity between those models, we are trying to actually take the best and kind of reduce the worst, right? So the worst for ensembles is like computational inefficiency. And the worst from MC dropout is like reduced uncertainty quality. And we hope that when we find this or when we have this spectrum, we can actually find the best uh, configuration, which brings the most of uncertainty, quality, and the most, the best of uh, the best of uh, computational yeah, expenses. Pardon, je ne peux pas se faire maintenant. Je ne peux pas le faire maintenant. Qu'est-ce que vous faites? Okay, oui, ça va. Um, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for the answer. Um, yeah, so we are trying to find the sweet spot between yeah. uh, between those two models, like continuity. That's the, the that's the whole point. Um, okay, another visualizations for visualization for the idea. Um, yeah, you can see on the uh, plot on the right, we have this kind of. <laughs> Um, plot when uh, where, where we can see how uh, the behavior of the model changes. On the x-axis, we have uh, such a um, parameter called scale. In general, the scale means that when it's one, the correlation of masks is by 100%. When it's infinity, it's zero. So the masks are completely unoverlapping. And when we have, uh, on the y-axis, we have number of masks pretty much, uh, I think it's self-explanatory. 
And the thing is that when we fix any point on each of these axes, we're actually getting a single model uh, method, which I mentioned before. If we, if, we, if we have only one mask and we fix some scale value, then yeah, we just we still have only one model. When we have 100% uh, correlation, doesn't matter how many masks you're taking, it's still the same model. So the orange dots represent single models. When we have scale parameter, when it goes to infinity, we are generating non overlapping mask, which means we actually have ensembles. And uh, yeah, when you fix any kind of any number for scale parameter and you just go to infinite number of masks, we, we go to to MC dropout approach with different uh, dropout rates. Uh, so yeah, actually that's related to your question. Uh, mass assembles allows us to traverse between those two. Uh, in a way, you can see this uh, this uh, yellow dot, and uh, we hope that we can employ this continuity to actually, uh, yeah, get the best quality of uncertainty at the same time the best computational overhead. <clears throat> okay, just the visualizations of how it actually works in more details. On the left, you can see, in general, we have two parameters for our model. Uh, they are already been mentioned. One of those is uh, masks IOU, which is basically correlation between masks and the number of masks. On the left, you can see an example of uh, like one layer MLP, which is which has like two dimensional inputs, two dimensional outputs, and we gradually decrease the correlation between models, which basically means that we increase the size of uh, hidden layer uh, from. So we decrease the correlation from one to some number. Yeah, it's hard to say from this particular uh, slide, but anyway, it's decreasing. And yeah, on the right, you can, you can see just an example of how we generate masks, but I'm not sure if it's very relevant. You can see the full description of how we control correlation between masks in the paper if you want. But yeah, the, the number of masks is just the number of masks we generate between tra before training. So the, the, uh, the masks are fixed um, during training, right? I mean, you have a fixed set of masks that have a certain overlap, and then you train with those, right? Yes. Did, did you feel, did you think that this have any impact on the performance? Because like, for example, when you train with dropout, the, the masks are random, right? Mm -hmm. so you just sample from some, uh, I don't know, factorized Bernoulli distribution. And then here you fix the mask. Did, did you expect, did you observe any impact on the performance or was it, did it not make a difference? I mean, in general, as, as we've seen in our experience, sometimes it could uh, lead to a slight drop as for, the, for, mm. for drop, dropout, because eventually the kind of the capacity of model is reduced, right? Because, oh, sorry, capacity of model is not reduced, but a uh, slight drop could happen but it's definitely smaller than for MC dropout. We just need to keep the same number of features for the layer. And in general, everything should be fine in terms of quality. Um, okay, there's like a small visualization of this continuity we've mentioned before. Uh, as I already mentioned, there's like two parameters. The first visualization for uh, would be for uh, model transition, model correlation. When we reduce the correlation uh, between masks, we efficiently go from single model to ensembles because masks are getting less and less correlated. And for another, for the second uh, parameter, we have number of masks, uh, which basically when we fix the scale parameter and we, uh, it increase the number of masks, we go from, <laughs> once again, we go from single model to MC dropout approach. Um, okay, switching to experiments. Uh, here's the visualization of the behavior when we have a single model and we uh, change the scale parameter for small, simple like uh, MLP model. Uh, when we reduce the uh, when we reduce the correlation between masks, we are actually getting like better uncertainty quality, as you can see here. Um, 
as far as I remember, number E is like the most correlated mask symbols model, and number F is actually ensemble, or uh, yeah, it's ensembles of the same number of models, like five models. And yeah, you can clearly see that there is like some continuity that we uh, gradually improve the quality of uncertainty in the way, and we get from single model to ensembles, let's say. How does how do we see that the uncertainty improves improves here? Um, improves in terms of so for example the the plot a clearly represents the bad uncertainty right it's just a boundary mm -hmm. a decision boundary which is which does not represent uncertainty for out of distribution samples right we need to have mm -hmm. uncertainty a large for boundary conditions like minus 15 to 15 and eventually yeah. when when we when we decrease the correlation this uncertainty we put into those corners, it grows, right? And uh, that's pretty much what we would expect for a better uncertainty. It's just easier and uh, easier to detect out of distribution samples this, in this particular case. Um, another experience experiments we ran were on um, such a data set called Image, ImageNet's Corrupted or ImageNet C which consists of uh, ImageNet, original ImageNet images, but with some uh, image corruption applied. As far as I remember, there was like eight or 10 different corruption uh, types with different levels of severity. Uh, you can see this like from one to five. Uh, eventually, what, what does those rep experience represent? What, what do this, do, those re experience represent is like um, when we increase severity of uh, of those corruptions, we expect the quality of our model to drop. And the slower this degradation happens, the better, because we would like to kind of, yeah, we would like to have some tool to actually work with those corruptions. We don't really want that, all this corruption to degrade our model. And in general, for both, oh, sorry, that was ImageNet C and CFRC also. There's like, for both of those that data set, we have these corruptions. And we, as we can see, we uh, perform pretty much close to ensembles and degradation happened in the same fashion as for ensembles when we properly tune the parameters for our model. Uh, so what does it mean here when you properly tune the a parameter of your models like so for example if i had an ensemble i, I would i would expect i have a certain budget of parameters because i have to like uh, have several i need to have several models right and like what what would be for example this uh, the the effective number of parameters then with your with your method okay. to get the same quality of uncertainty so here in those experiments, what yeah. we've done, we, we've actually fixed the number of masks. And the only mm -hmm. thing we've been changing were correlation of uh, submodels. What does yeah. it mean to tune these parameters? Means that we need to find the, the good correlation of masks. Yeah. I mean, if it would be too large, uh, then you probably would not get this much of the effect. If it would be, if it would be too low, there would not be difference between ensembles and mm -hmm. our model in terms of computational budget. Therefore, you need to kind of tune this parameter to find the, the spot when you're getting the best results, which you are like trying to achieve. Was it like closer to ensembles or closer to dropout? I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, as far as I remember, there was something in between, surprisingly. Okay. So that was not too large. Uh, they, I mean, in terms of, for example, number of weights we've been using for our model, that was significantly lower than the number of uh, weights for um, number of weights for ensembles. Yeah, that's the major point, I guess, in this particular situation. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I mentioned both of this metrics accuracy is uh, known thing. There's another thing called ECE. Uh, it's the metric that evaluates uh, calibration for the model. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I have to go into details. That's just one of the metrics to evaluate calibration of uncertainty you're generating. Uh, another experience we tried, we tried to observe uh, this continuity when we have, so we once again, we fix number of masks and we try to change the, 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 the scale parameter, the correlation between models. 
And for both of the data set, we observed that uh, we eventually, if, effectively, we are moving from a single model to ensembles when we kind of change the scale parameter from one to the large, large numbers. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the major point of this those particular two, two plots is that we actually observe this continuity, this gradient, let's say. Um, yeah, another thing we tried, we, we fixed the uh, capacity of the model, which basically means that we fixed parameters M and N. It's like uh, the number of masks and um, Oh, sorry, I already got confused in the, in the, those letters. As far as I remember, M is number of masks, and number and N is actual number of uh, active features for one particular mask, right? For example, if we stayed for this particular layer, we have ten masks active always, right? And then we've been changing the scale parameter, which basically effectively changes the correlation between models. We observe that we pretty much go from single model behavior to ensembles for all of the metrics for calibration accuracy and those auto distribution. Um, yeah, final numbers. What, what is the major point here to make is that uh, comparing to ensembles, we are generate, we, we pretty much perform closely for CIFAR that was very close, pretty much the same numbers for uh, ImageNet that was like slightly lower. But at the same time, we are getting a huge uh, reduction in uh, training time. Yeah, basically training time and memory. Uh, we observe this both for uh, CFR and ImageNet results. And uh, yeah, we still perform significantly better than MC Dropout. Um, yeah, I think it actually brings me to the end of the presentation. Uh, I left here the QR code for the uh, site I've mentioned. Uh, you can check it out if you want to, to get to the code, to get to, uh, to some small video, pretty much uh, the video I put to, on YouTube. It's like a complete replica of what I just uh, mentioned in this talk. But what are like key takeaways from uh, the talk and the paper in general? Uh, Mask Sambos is a, a cheap and rather easy to implement approach to uncertainty estimation. It's like the same thing as dropout layer. You can just drop in, drop it in, and it works. Um, it allows, the, from theoretical perspective, it allows us to span between those two popular methods to uncertainty estimation as ensembles and MC dropout. And as I already mentioned, proper tuning of those parameters allows us to make use of this computational quality trade-off, which is the major practical, uh, major practical application, let's say strong side of the method. Um, yeah, thank you for your attention. I would be happy to answer your question. And yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Yes, cool. Um, thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Otherwise, I I have one. Maybe it's a bit bit of an outlook on whether you have uh, whether you have thought about this. Mm -hmm. um, so you use a um, like fixed set of masks at the moment. Yeah. Did you also think about like um, uh, maybe generalizing it to the case where you have instead of uh, I don't know a set of um, m fixed masks or n fixed masks, just a set of uh, and um, random vectors that are somehow correlated to some degree. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be, it's like for, 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 for Monte Carlo dropout, you always have the <laughs> same random vector, right? And then for, for ensembles, you just have a, they are completely decorrelated, but you could also say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna still sample my, my masks, but just from different dropout probability distribution. Mm, I'm not sure if I got this, the, the first part, could okay. you repeat it? Uh, so I, I just thought, I was just curious whether you thought about this, like because you you just basically pre-compute the mask, so you fix your ones and zeros, yeah. And then but then the and then you say okay, so since they have a limited overlap, they are somewhat in between Monte Carlo dropout and ensembles, which makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, did you also think about okay, maybe this I could also say okay, now I don't fix the mask, but I just say they come some from some 
from some distribution, so from let's say some random vector, and then mm -hmm. for each of my uh, for my different masks, I have a different random vector from like so kind of like a different uh, the different multivariate Bernoulli distribution from which I sample the masks. I mean, I'm not sure yeah. what will make any difference, but yeah, I think in some way what you're, you're what you're saying is basically yeah. like a generalization of our approach in the way yeah. of when where, where 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 from you're generating your masks. I think. I mean, we approached this idea from perspective of actually we tried. So there, there's another paper which is rather similar in the way called Butch Ensemble, mm -hmm. and uh, there we have. I think I know that. Yeah, we we have like a trainable masks, and they are not eventually binary. Those are just vectors, like real value vectors. And during training, you train them. Actually, uh, we we try to apply something in this fashion. So instead of actually binary mask, we've been trying to uh, we've been trying to use, for example, Gaussian vectors or something like this, and that was not working well. Um, yeah, I mean, there's probably some explanation from this. Uh, yeah, I have some ideas why it could work like this, but uh, I think it's just off topic a bit. Yeah, I guess so. Are there any other questions? Hey, uh, yeah, I also have a question. Um, maybe I missed it, but have you also tried it for OD detection? Like what for your metrics there? Could you go into that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we had out ah, here you go. Okay. For, for, for those things. So yeah, basically we've been trying to evaluate both calibration and auto distribution detection. So like, I think those are the, the, are the most popular ways to evaluate uncertainty quality. Yeah. Uh, is it common that Monte Carlo dropout is so close to ensembles in performance? Uh, for which particular data set for CIFAR? Yeah, or on ImageNet, I think. Um, I cannot say that, uh, I, I guess it depends on many, on many things, like a data set and architecture you're using, but yeah, in general, MC dropout is not performing like very bad. If you tune it properly, it can actually, uh, show very competitive performance. So yeah, in general, the answer would be yes. Okay. Thank you, Nikita. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. One 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 observation that I had in this regard as well is that it correlates very strongly with your with your performance. So if you have a model that has a good predictive performance, you or the uncertainty estimate, like your out of distribution detection. I don't know uncertainty estimation in general, but your out of distribution detection can be better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Whereas if you have a model that, that is very sense. shitty, then uh, that might not be the case, then it might be a bit worse. Mm -hmm. So in the so in this in this plot, basically you have this uh, continuous improvement of your method, right? Like when you when you go from your from Monte Carlo dropout to ensemble. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's written here and I just don't see it fast enough. Is it like the this dashed line is really what you literally get when you train an ensemble, right? I mean, not, not yeah, just yeah. the yeah, extreme yeah, yeah. value of the method. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay, that's, that's pretty neat. Does it make much different if you then like, so for an ensemble, you have different ways of training it, right? So you could train it just with different random seeds, but some people add additional randomness into it by also using different subsets of the data. Um, I don't know, do, do you think these these kind of like, uh, these kind of different additional sources of randomness that uh, training your ensemble members could have an impact? Like could, could it boost ensembles even further? Or do you think this training different, like training, this is this essentially just, considers the randomness of training with different seats, right? So do you mm -hmm. think the training with different random seats of your model is the most important component? I'm not sure, we, we haven't looked yeah. at it. Like, uh, it's hard to say, but probably that could be the case, yes.
Okay, cool. I mean, uh, are there any further questions? I mean, otherwise we can call it a day early. I think it was re really well presented. Maybe that's also why there are yeah. not that many questions. Yeah, that very, might be the case. Very clear. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. Okay, anyway, I'll switch to this slide if you would yeah. like to take something. I don't know. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, How is it going, uh, Jan, by the way? I think uh, we haven't chatted in a while, <laughs> at least since ICML. Uh, yeah, I mean, I in November and yeah. um, I want to continue this uncertainty project um, and have a new project on the side. So, yeah, I'm just settling into both. Uh, and uh, yeah, actually, I have a lot of people from the single cell community that want to try the models. I'm like, shit, the code isn't there yet. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. I think I need to have a few days hackathon and then 